Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mark, and I'm a professional philosopher. Uh, I know I, I, there are days I wake up and it surprises me too. Uh, it's it's a bit like saying you're a professional magician or juggler or something of that sort. Uh, I wanted to start by sharing a little bit of the story of how I became a professional philosopher. And I should say that by that, I only mean that I have the great privilege to get paid to read and write and think for a living and to share my thoughts and hear the thoughts of others. Uh, as a teacher of philosophy, as someone who works with students every day, it's been my great pleasure to provoke thought. And uh, I should say, though, that I didn't start out uh, thinking at any point that I would end up this way. Uh, I had no expectation that I would be a professional philosopher. And partly because uh, when I was a young boy, uh, I couldn't even imagine. There was no prediction, no vision into the future far enough, no stretch of the imagination long enough for me to get to the idea that someone could spend his or her life thinking, reading, writing, and talking for a living. Uh, I grew up in a military family, and my greatest expectation, my greatest wish, was to be a pilot. Uh, my father was a navigator, and we moved around the country, all different parts of Canada, as my father pursued his career. And uh, like many of the boys and, and some of the girls on the bases where I grew up, I was in love with airplanes. Uh, I had models of them hanging from the ceilings of the different bedrooms I lived in. I, I had books that I poured over. I read all the stories of the greatest pilots. And I thought, I want to be a pilot. I want to be in control of an airship and find my way. My father was skeptical. And I think it was partly because he knew the old saying about pilots, some of you may know it, there are old pilots and bold pilots, but there are no old, bold pilots. Uh, and it's a dangerous occupation. Uh, but I could never shake this expectation that that might be the life that I would lead. And I have to say that it has only been as a result of stumbling into things that I have ended up where I am now. Uh, I look back and I don't see plans and I don't see concrete expectations, uh, but I do see little nodes of connection and this first image is one of those. Um, I'm sure many of you in the audience know Saint-Exupéry's great classic children's book, which of course is not just for children, Le Petit Prince. Uh, I don't remember when I first read this book and I don't remember when I first found out that Saint-Exupéry was also an accomplished pilot. Uh, a pilot who died a tragic death, a mysterious death. Uh, Saint-Exupéry said something wonderful about the connection between expectations and planning. As a navigator of his own plane, he knew that it's not all about dreams. You have to be concrete and practical. And he said, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And I want to talk today about plans and how we get to goals with our plans. But I also want to talk about the complications of planning things and the very idea of getting somewhere. Uh, I remarked at, at, over lunch to somebody that so far today we've been talking about great expectations, but I don't think anybody has said anything about how oppressive expectations can be. Uh, the things that people expect of us, our parents, our cultures, our traditions, uh, these can be difficult and they can be felt as burdens that we would rather shuck off and find a different kind of freedom. Uh, so expectations are a complicated burden and it's difficult to think about what to do with them until we start getting concrete and getting practical. So if we want to pursue a goal and make it more than a wish, we need a plan. As a boy who grew up in a military family, I found my philosophical uh, inspiration from a variety of sources, not all of them reputable as philosophers. Uh, this is an image of George S. Patton uh, as a two to three star general as he was then. Uh, he would later rise to an even higher rank, uh, famously depicted um, by George C. Scott in that um, epic movie. And Patton said something wonderful about plans. He said, a good plan violently execute, ex executed this week is better than a perfect plan next week. Sometimes we have to make do with the good 
rather than the perfect. And you may know the expression that the perfect can be the enemy of the good. Sometimes if we wait around for perfection or if we seek perfection, we can miss what is right in front of us, which is a good plan, a good enough plan, if we execute it violently. It's not always obvious, however, the difference between the perfect and the good, nor is it obvious when good enough is not good enough, when we should continue to seek for perfection. As a military man, Patton had that same practical urgency that we see in saint exupéry's uh, idea of planning. Um, but it's not as simple simply as having a plan. There we go. Oops. Thank you. Uh, another military thinker, a philosopher of gifts, this is uh, the friendly face of Field Marshal Helmut von Mulke. Um, he looks like somebody you'd want to sit down and have a schnapps with. Uh, <coughs> especially if he ordered you to. Uh, and von Moltke said something which has gone down in the annals of military thinking, uh, and you may have heard various versions of it. He said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. And what he meant, of course, is that however meticulous you are in your strategy and tactics, realities change the situation immediately. And as soon as you come into contact with the enemy, or let us say just the world, everything changes. You may have to abandon your plan. You will certainly have to modify your plan. And uh, I appreciate the slightly more uh, pithy version of this from the great philosopher and pugilist Mike Tyson, uh, also responsible for making biting ears a tactic in boxing. Uh, Mike Tyson said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So that's true. You can go into the ring with a plan. I'm not sure Evander Holyfield anticipated having his ear bitten off. Uh, I'm sure he anticipated getting punched in the face. Uh, but you can go into the ring with the best plan in the world, and as soon as that first blow hits, uh, you may panic, and your plan may go out the window. So planning is hard. It's hard to know the difference between the perfect and the good. It's hard to know what to do when we have contact with the enemy or when we get punched in the face. Uh, I think the best general philosophy about plans is this one, and that is every plan is a contingency plan. Every plan A must be implicitly a plan B. You must always not just have a replacement plan, but a contingency, a set of contingencies for every plan that you have. Uh, Robbie Burns, the great Scottish poet, said, uh, the, the best laid plans of mice and men gang after glay, which of course means uh, no matter how good your plans are, no matter who you are, great or small, things are going to go wrong. So you have to be ready. Now let's think about the different ways in which planning works and what planning is for. One of the most obvious things we need plans for is to solve problems. And indeed it is, I think, a piece of obvious wisdom that you can't effectively solve a problem unless you have a plan. An, an algorithm of some kind. Right? It might be a complicated algorithm like this one. It might be a simple algorithm about planning a journey on the highway from point A to point B. Uh, and that seems simple enough, and it seems like an obvious thing about plans that we use them to solve problems. But I want to draw your attention to a problem with problems. And that is uh, what's sometimes called the paradox of relevance. Oftentimes, problems are driven by solutions. And that might sound paradoxical, but what I mean is, oftentimes we unconsciously frame a problem in ways that we already are used to solving problems. So the solution, or the kind of solution that we're used to getting, drives even the way we think of the problem. A quick story to illustrate this. A friend of mine was commissioned by the mayor of Rio de Janeiro to address the traffic problem in that large city. And he went down to Brazil and studied with a bunch of urban planners and architects and and traffic experts, and they commissioned blue papers and white papers and red papers, and they had all this evidence amassed, and they went back to the mayor and they said, uh, unfortunately, we have come to the conclusion that there is no solution to the problem of traffic in Rio de Janeiro. And the mayor said, ah, good news. Because as I understand it, problems are things with solutions. So if you tell me that there is no solution to traffic in Rio de Janeiro, I conclude that there is no problem of traffic in regions. 
The paradox of relevance can lock us into ways of thinking that we don't even consciously recognize. We have to make a special extra effort to get outside of that box. This is what sometimes also called the unknown knowns. Not the unknown unknowns, right? Not the things that we don't know that we don't know, but the things that we don't know that we know. The things that we unconsciously know, like this is this kind of problem, and I'm going to move through to a solution. A second kind of thing we do with plans is we act collectively. So we might plan a neighborhood, as this depiction is of architects, planners. Uh, we might use this to solve problems of action coordination. So for example, uh, here in Switzerland, you drive on the same side of the road as we do back home in North America. But if I went to England, then I would have to learn to drive on the other side of the road. There is no right answer to that question except the answer that operates where you are. That's a simple kind of solution to a collective action problem. How do we direct traffic? It doesn't matter, right or left, it just matters that everybody's doing the same thing. Now that again sounds good, right? That's another good way to plan. We'll plan our highway system this way. Or we'll plan it that way, but as long as we plan it and everybody follows the plan, it will work. But notice a problem with this kind of plan. Collective action is the sum total of individual actions. And often, individual actions, even though they look rational, generate complicated and even self-defeating outcomes. The classic instance of this is what's called the tragedy of the commons. So I have common ground, common pasture, and everybody in the community is allowed to graze their animals upon it. Reason demands out of their individual interest that they should graze as many animals as they can on that common pasture. And, of course, that holds for everyone. But the result is, in the classic version of this, that as soon as everyone follows that individual action, they generate a self-defeat. Because soon, too many animals are grazing on the pasture, and the pasture is ruined for everyone. So every single person following their individual interests generates a bad result for every single person. So collective action problems are that class of things, human activities, where what we think we're doing as individuals is rational, and each one of us is going about our business, and yet as we do it, we generate a defeat for everyone, including ourselves. This isn't just a competition where somebody wins. This is a race to the bottom, as it's sometimes put. Everybody loses. So plans need to address collective action problems, and they need to articulate collective interests. Because what collective action problems show us is that simply summing individual interests doesn't equal collective interest. Collective interest is a different thing. And so again, we have to break the box of much of our planning and find another way of looking. The last thing that we usually do with plans is coordinate individual actions. Right? So I put a date in my date book and I say, I will meet you somewhere. Right? This seems like a simple thing, but I want to say this. This is a promise of a special kind. It's not just a little thing that you could make or break. A plan is a promise to the future. It's a promise to your future self in a small instance that you will be somewhere where someone else is meeting you. But it is a promise always to the future. And I want to say planning is a kind of dance to the music of time. Planning is a bargain with our future selves. And it involves its own problems. The sometimes uh, black swan effect, the rare event which can't be predicted, is a limit on prediction into the future. But an even better and more important bird to consider is the turkey. In North America, we have a holiday called Thanksgiving. Canada and the US celebrate it on different days, but we have the same tradition. We slaughter turkeys and eat them. This is what we're doing. That's Thanksgiving. So if you were a turkey and you were plotting your happiness over time, this is what you would find you would find that as the year goes on, you get happier and happier because you get fatter and fatter. They keep these humans, they keep feeding you more and more food. And you think, wow, if I base my future predictions on past happenstance, life is good. But boom, Thanksgiving. And there you go. <clears throat> this is a, a concrete way of what we call the problem of induction. We can only predict the future based on our knowledge of the past. It's the only thing we have to go on. And yet, 
The problem of induction reminds us that basing our sense of the future solely on the past is caught in a kind of problem, a paradox. We are going to be wrong. And because we're going to be wrong, we may find ourselves paralyzed. Turkey doesn't have that option. It's dead and gone. But we have the option to think about what it means to be paralyzed. And we also have the option of thinking about the possibility of unintended effects. We can't always know what our actions will produce and consequences, but we can always know that the consequences will be, in part, unknown. So, uh, to conclude, I want to draw your attention to something that you may not know about called the Godzilla threshold. And I want you to think about this, the Godzilla threshold, whenever you think about expectations. The Godzilla threshold is a convention that when things have gone so wrong, and all of the plans that you've made have been so bad, that and all of the damage seems so intense, and nothing seems uh, worth doing except panicking, call in Godzilla. Right? Because no matter how much damage Godzilla inflicts, better Godzilla than nothing. This is the so-called Godzilla threshold. Now, the problem with the Godzilla threshold is that it comes out of failure. It's the wrong kind of response to failure. This is, I think, a complicatedly wise response to failure. This is from Beckett. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. Fail better, fail, try again, fail better. You're going to fail, we're all going to fail. Don't call in Godzilla. You, when you cross the threshold, think about failure and what you can do. And I wanna say, especially to the students, the great privileges that you enjoy, like all of us, we planned in our different ways, and we have the privilege of being in the same room together. You are in this wonderful school for 130 years. It has been educating some of the best and brightest students from around the world. Spider-Man was right. With great power comes great responsibility. You may be tired of hearing this. I'm serious about this point. You may be tired of hearing about how good you have it, but you do. And the rest of us are waiting to see what you do with that. We have great expectations of you. So, um, sorry, to revive an old slogan from 68, which I still think is relevant. Uh, I don't know why it ever went out of fashion, so let's bring it back. Be reasonable, demand the impossible. When people say that's impossible, that's your clue. They say, peace on earth is impossible. The elimination of torture is impossible. Justice is impossible. Whenever somebody says that, you say, okay, that's when I get into action. That's when I form my plan. And always, always have a plan, because rest assured, uh, if you don't, Godzilla does. Thank you very much.